Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. Their son went from star athlete to homeless moocher. I sleep at schools, park benches. If my parents are home, I'll sleep in the shed. They kicked him out. Did you tell your mother, I'm not leaving? You can't get me out of here because I'm bigger than you? I did. Where do you get off doing that? But now... What is it you blame them for? What did they do? They're in for a shock. How can you possibly accuse us of doing that? Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. I try to be an emotional compass and point you in the right direction. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. This high school student, Ian, who was an accomplished athlete, an honor student with a scholarship to play college basketball. So how did he go from this to being homeless, living on the streets, and sometimes sleeping in this shed just a few years later? What if I told you his parents say being homeless was fundamentally Ian's choice ever since they stopped letting him live off their money. Now, Ian's parents claim they're sick and tired of helping out their once successful son, who they say has turned into an unemployed college dropout who just smokes pot and plays video games. Now, Ian's claim, since he can't live at home, he'll just live out on the streets. Ian was a very wonderful child. I was a good student. I did AP. I was an honor roll. I made the presidential list one time. Ian was a great athlete. He loved playing sports. I loved the game of basketball. And I always had dreams of being professional. But it didn't work out. When Ian went to college, he actually had been using marijuana. I fell in love with smoking. I was smoking every day. My third year of college, I lost motivation to go to college, and I dropped out, and I never went back. We let him move back in our house with the idea that he would figure out what he wanted to do with his life. In the year that Ian lived with us, Ian basically did nothing. He didn't get a job. He would sleep super late. He would be at home playing video games. Three months ago, we had to kick Ian out of our home. We got a restraint. Order. I was shocked when they said that. At first I thought I was being punked. The police showed up and had to remove Ian from our home. Ian tried to come home a couple of times. The very first time that he returned home, my husband and Ian had an argument and the police had to be called. Ian was arrested. He spent overnight in jail. When I was arrested, I was legally searched. I was not read my Miranda rights. I was being a the cop because I do know my rights. Ian has been out of the house for roughly three months. He started sleeping on the street. This whole situation tears me apart. To see him throw his life away is really, really hard. It's very devastating. I just want to know what happened to that fun-loving kid that I sent off to college. Okay, what did happen in y'all's opinion? He came home from university at Christmas time and he went back and I started receiving these weird texts that said, Mom, you know I'm not gay, right? And I said, okay. And then he'd say that people were watching him and um, his professors knew what, were, what he was doing all of the time. And... And sports-wise, how was that going for him? Um, well, he was in his third year. He no longer played college sports. Um, but uh, according to his friends from college, he stopped going to open gyms. He just sat and played video games and <clears throat> smoked pot all day. Okay. So he was... On a scholarship to begin with. For two years, yes. Uh-huh. We didn't see a <clears throat> shift until that third year. Okay. Now, you okay, said okay. that he acted weird on a family vacation. This is when it got scary. I mean, to be honest with you, is that we brought him on a trip with us, and you could see that, you know, this looks like Ian, but what he was doing was 
horrible. I mean, it was schizophrenic is the best way I can describe it. I mean, you're talking personality where he's just sitting there looking off into space and with a big smile on his face, and you're thinking, you know, almost like he was high just for an instant. And then all of a sudden that personality would go away and he would, he would shake it off. And then all of a sudden, then he'd be talking to somebody next to him. There's nobody there. Did you ever talk to him and say, hey, buddy, um, you know, a few minutes ago, you were talking to somebody that wasn't there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's what's going on? Well, there was a several. Did, did times, you do that? Yes. And what did he say? He, I sometimes uh, talk to myself. Does that bother you? He was constantly um, making excuses for it. In July of of, of 2014, uh, he had a drug test because he was involved in rehab, and he tested positive. For marijuana, THC. Correct. Uh, but negative for everything else. Yes. Have you talked to him about the marijuana and what does he say? He tells us that it's legal and that he should be able to do what he wants. You basically said, I want you to move out. Yes. He said, I'm not leaving. Yes. You it came can't down, make me it leave. came down to, he told leave. me that, how are you going to? How are you going to make me move? I'm bigger than you. And so we got a restraining order. So now he's living on the street with a knapsack as a pillow and a park bench as a bed. That is unless he's sneaking back onto the property and sleeping in his parents' shed unbeknownst to them. Since Ian's been kicked out, I'm not sure how Ian spends his day. I spend my days at the library, riding the bus. I day sleeping also, just sort of passing the time. This is my pack. I keep a pair of pants, got a jacket, keep my winter coat with me. The streets are cold out here. They see him on the street, he's looking for a bus. I sleep at schools, stadiums, park benches. Anywhere I can find. I saw him one morning sleeping on a bench in the park close by our home. I couldn't help him. He looked all alone. The streets are tough out here. I wouldn't recommend this lifestyle for anyone, truthfully. When my parents are home, I'll sleep in the shed. I come in here and sleep. Uh, when it's raining, I don't tell them. I try to stay away from it during the day. It's usually just like a halfway house. It sucks, but it's a lot better than sleeping on concrete. Sometimes when my parents are home, I'll sneak in the house. I'll make a sandwich and like Pop-Tarts and stuff. No. Oh, you want that one? Yeah. Recently, I've been able to come home for dinner and I don't try and like overstay my welcome. I blame my parents for how I am right now. Okay, it's good to meet you. Thank you, good to meet you too. Um, you blame your parents for how you are right now. What is it you blame them for? What did they do? They say that I'm not complying to their rules and stuff, but I feel like I've obeyed 99.9% .9 of them. And if, they, if I am disobeying them, it's not, I'm not doing it on purpose. Like I'm not doing it to spite them, you know, like. Ian, did you or did you not? smoke weed in our house i did is that a rule uh obviously it's not courteous Ian, we made that rule we told you you said if we find out you're drinking find out you're smoking weed you know what the, the opportunity to live at home again when you were you know 21 years old was gone we had these rules and we said you're going to follow them I'm not sure that it's your guys' business of what I'm doing in my room because I am paying rent. Well, and that's exactly it. And that's the part where you get to be a grown adult, and that's why you're in a situation that you're in. Did you tell your mother, I'm not leaving, you can't get me out of here because I'm bigger than you? I did. Where the hell do you get off doing that? And later... And how can you possibly accuse us of doing that? To you. That's a serious allegation. If it's true, it could and should ruin their lives. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil, the shocking viral video. An alleged bully went after a visually impaired student. He said he didn't know you were blind. He knew he would call me blind. A classmate stops the attack. I saw the kid getting into Austin's face. Why would you have to hurt him? Now the boy hailed as a hero. And the blind teen speak out. Honestly, I feel like you saved my life. 
That's tomorrow. We've seen a lot of Dr. Phil shows that had to do with moochers. He lives in his parents' garage. My 37-year-old son is a freeloader. You're laying on your ass in the garage till 2 in the afternoon? That's not okay. Several of the things that Dr. Phil has mentioned, we should not enable our child. It's a tough line for me. I've asked myself many, many times, what did I do wrong? Is this your fault? No. Do you blame yourself for him being on the street? I, mean, I, wonder, I wonder what we did wrong. I mean, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't wonder where he's at, what he's doing, is he okay? But truly, I feel like I've been the best parent that I possibly can. Then why is this eating you alive? Because it just, he seems to not be bothered by it. It's almost like he's a very different person. He's, he's showing a lack of any kind of get up and go. Like, he's 22, make something of himself. Well, this comes down to, I mean, when we raised him, I mean, we're, we're hardworking people, both of us are. And we raised our kids, I, I feel like, we raised them in a, in a fashion for success, to be able to do, you know, whatever success means to them. You know, I feel like that we've, we've created those opportunities for you to be able to do that. And now, you, I feel like that you choose to live on the street. Their question is, where did that guy go? And my answer is, to jail, to the streets. Um, okay, and this was way I'm never, I'm never calling the cops on my own son. I'm never sending my own son to the streets. To live outside. Okay, um, hold on, Ian. I'm never going to do a lot of the things that they do, but they are my parents, and I do respect that. Did you tell your mother, I'm not leaving, you can't get me out of here because I'm bigger than you? I did. Where the hell do you get off doing that? And I agree, but... What, who do you think you are to tell somebody in their own home, doctor, you can't get me out of here? I would never lay a hand on my mother. Um, like I said... The whole through the whole process thought it was being punked. And what made that so, okay with you to say that to her? I, I mean, I've been through the, I've been with this woman through everything. I I felt um, like I was being attacked, low key. Like I don't know. I feel like I have a certain set of rights, and they weren't being given to me. You know. So you you felt like you were entitled to be there. This is your house too. Well, I, in my defense, I do pay rent. You didn't pay rent the last month and a half that you were staying at our house. I was evicted June 12th, which is you're supposed to get out of an establishment where you're paying rent. We didn't have a contract. You are supposed to get 14 days notice if they're going to evict you. So why would I pay rent at a place where I know I'm going to get evicted in 14 days? This, this didn't happen over a two week period. You know what, the final straw, when we said, you know what, Ian, it's done. You got two weeks, make it happen, because there's no screwing around this time. We and gave would, you and they also tried to kick three me out months before in the process. Too, hey, which, Ian, it's time for you to, you know, you want to do your own <clears> thing. It's, it's everything from doing dishes to doing chores around the house to getting a job. I mean, everything is just like, everything is like, I'll do it in my timeline. And when you get questioned on it, do you remember me questioning you on something? It's like, okay, Ian, you know, you don't have a job yet. You've been looking for a job? <clears> yep, been looking for a job. How much time are you spending that? None of your business. That's not No, that is it. not a lie. You told me that. No, I didn't. Ian, talking Don't about this stuff, I am not lying you on TV. Lying. Okay. Well, I looked at the police report, and, it's, and, and here's what they wrote down. I arrived and saw Ian riding his skateboard in the driveway at David's residence. I detained Ian, cuffing him and placing him in the back of my patrol truck. I talked to David and Rachel. Ian had not been in the house and had not caused any disturbance. They both wanted to press charges for violation of the protection order. I talked to Ian. He said he had been served a court order, but he said he didn't think it was real. He appeared to be under the influence of something or slightly mentally ill. Now, this is when they picked you up on the 18th of June. Were you high when they picked you up? No, sir. All right, so what's really going on with Ian? Is he just enjoying the extended summer vacation? Or is something really wrong? His parents are saying, why is it okay with him? Um, 
his parents think he may actually be suffering some type of PTSD after experiencing some kind of traumatic abuse. They're just full of questions. They don't know. We'll talk about this, and maybe Ian can shed some light on all of this when we come back. Ian's behavior has been very odd. He's said some very off-the-wall things. It's so bizarre. I don't know what to believe anymore. And later, when they did what they did, then they got to own the result. And the result is, you resent the hell out of them for that. And I do blame them. How would you like to make Dr. Phil history? Log on to omaze.com slash robin to donate for a chance at a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. A very special guest is going to walk a day in my shoes. You and a friend will fly out to Los Angeles, get all glammed up, and get the hair done, and get your makeup done. We're going to have a ball. And then you'll join me here on the set right here for a very special taping of the Dr. Phil Show. Here's where we make history. At the end of the show, you will become the first fan ever to join me and Philip on national television for our signature walk-off. And the best part of all is that all entries support my foundation, Win Georgia Smile. And it's only $10. That's right. For $10, you get a chance to walk a day in my shoes and be a part of all of this. My husband and I are very conservative. I don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs, I don't swear. My family is very strict. We have rules in our home that our children must obey. This whole thing that we are doing was never meant to disown him. Ian wants to do things his own way. You can do what you want to do, but it's not here. My parents think that I am using them. They see me as their deadbeat son that can't find a job. I don't think they give me enough credit. Well, we're talking to 22-year-old Ian, whose parents, Rachel and Tino, predicted would be a huge success when he headed off to college with a basketball scholarship, having graduated with all A's in honors classes from high school. So where did things get off track from what they had as a vision for their son? Ian's behavior has been very odd. He's just said some very off-the-wall things. Ian accused my husband and I of doing drugs. Ian accused my husband and I of poking him with needles. The most shocking thing that Ian has done, he texted one of his friends that my husband and I were raping him. I know it sounds very far-fetched, but I have accused him of raping me. I do wake up sometimes with uh, needle marks on my arms. When he said that, complete astonishment is what came through my mind. That was just preposterous. I have no idea where he would even come up with that. I am gang-related, so I know what drugs do to you. <laughs> I don't know, it's difficult to, like, explain. <laughs> I think that Ian has a mental illness, very possibly has schizophrenia. I think that it's out of their hands now. I think that I'm in the system, and it's a system that is designed to fail. It's a trap. Young black males are either dead or in jail. Having to deal with all of this is a nightmare. It's so bizarre, I don't know what to believe anymore. You said that your parents drugged you and raped you. Like I said, it is very far-fetched. So as far as the accusation, um, I'll own it in saying that, yes, I have. You have what? I have accused them of doing so. Ian, how can you possibly accuse us of doing that to you? That's a serious allegation. It, if, if it's true, it could and should ruin their lives. It's either a serious allegation or it's definitely slander, one of the two. There's no, there's no middle ground here. Absolutely. So you, you, you truly believe that this is a possibility? Yes. Uh -huh. And what's your basis for believing that it could have happened? What's the, what um, do you point to? You said you found needle marks? On, I have. Where were the needle marks? Um, 
on my abdomen, on my forearms. I've I've had a few like right on my uh, right on my artery, like right here. Like, did you get photo evidence of that? Did you have a well? Like I, w that? I wasn't aware that we were going to be talking about this, but uh, no, I didn't. Do you have needle marks today? <clears throat> Uh, if I do, I, I'm not looking for them anymore. You guys have pretty much ruled it out and made me look stupid for even accusing you, so. I mean, if you seriously think that you got raped, you should be seeing a psychologist. You should be seeing a doctor and saying, hey, you know what, I think this is happening. Check me out. Uh, and I have. I did take a mental health evaluation, mm -hmm. and it did come back negative. Well, I didn't know they could be positive or negative. I oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Truthfully. However, but you, I did you, take... You say that you, they may have raped you, drugged you and raped you. They may have. Ha, has, has this... Has, has anyone else ever perpetrated this on you? Uh, no. Ian, remember when you told me that that happened at college as well? When I... Then why did you just tell him that that didn't happen? Because I'm trying to prove a point here. That the you guys changed your story on proof? everything. Did you tell them you'd been raped in college? As a man, I believe that it is something that you should try and overcome. Um, like I said, I am gang related. Um, I'm not going to get, on, get into it on TV. I have been around the life. I've been around drugs. But you're in a gang? Yes, I have been in a gang. Okay. And... Did you, did you tell your mother that you had raped others? I've told them that I've participated in initiation. I have a really definitive question that I think is going to maybe uh, clear a lot of things up here. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ian right after the break. We'll be right back. Thursday on an all-new Dr. Phil. Oprah Winfrey! Oprah is back. How y'all doing? Her new life. I'm cleaning out my office in Chicago. I'm still letting go. Her new passions. You've changed a lot. So why did you stop this? Her new series. This is the biggest human event on Earth. You hear about love stories, but this is a love story. Okay, I'm going to cry over that. That's Thursday. Do you believe that you have suffered an injustice at the hands of these two people that put you, as you describe it, a young black man into the system and therefore have sealed your fate in this life? I'm not going to say that it sealed my fate. I think that it's at this point it's out of their hands, like there's really nothing they can do about it. And I do blame them for it. Do you believe that when you choose the behavior, you choose the consequences? I say that when you choose it, you have to own it. When they did what they did, they chose to put you out using the law, then they gotta own the result. And the result is, you resent the hell out of them for that, do you not? I don't know if resentment's the right word. I'd call it sadness. Uh -huh. I'm sad that they would do that to their own child. Did you choose that by violating the rules of the house? Did you choose that by smoking dope in their home? I don't think marijuana is dope. You're probably a little funkier than me. Like, you're a little older. You've been in the 70s, so it, it, it was dope back then. Um, <laughs> Let me tell you, don't let this suit fool you, because I only wear it for the camera. <laughs> and I've been homeless just like you, uh, but it wasn't because my parents put me out of the house. It's because there wasn't a house to be put out of. And it doesn't matter whether it's smoking dope or chewing gum. If it's the rules of the house and they say you can't do that here, and you choose to do that there, then they have a right to put you out. Now, let me ask something. Are there times that um, you get really confused? Mm, 
Not really, no. <laughs> Are there times that you're talking to yourself or someone else and you're not situationally aware? I'll own that, yeah. I do. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not passing judgment. I'm just asking a yeah. about facts. As far as someone telling me that how I handle my brain is wrong, like, who are you to say that? Especially when I know for a fact that I'm smarter than the man that has been saying this, like, and most geniuses are crazy, like, you know that, right? A lot of geniuses are drug addicts, too. Do you, do you ever consider yourself suspicious, defensive, or paranoid? Absolutely. Defensive beyond all recognition because I've never been able to verbally defend myself against my parents. Do you think it was jumping to a conclusion when I asked you if you were sometimes disoriented and you responded defensively and suspiciously and in a paranoid fashion? Is that what you're accusing me of? I'm asking you. Um... Because you, you responded by saying, you know, you, you, you're going to tell me what to do with my brain. You're not going to tell Absolutely. All I ask is if you sometimes were disoriented. No. Okay. What would you consider your biggest achievement so far in your life? Uh, my degree, probably. What would you consider your biggest failure? <laughs> never thought I'd go to jail. And what is your biggest fear? That I'll never be able to see my sisters again. Well, Rachel wanted Ian to take a drug test, and he agreed. The results after the break. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil exclusive. An alleged bully went after a visually impaired student. The blind student. Why were you being hit? Rescued by a classmate. You saved my life. That's tomorrow. Rachel very much wanted Ian to take a drug test. Because your theory is he, he might be on something like weird. I, I don't. I don't know. You don't know. I just, his action, to his, this. Yeah, I want some answers as to why he continues down this path that is bizarre. Are you on some kind of drugs? Um, nothing that can't be prescribed by a doctor. Like what? Um, marijuana. Mm -hmm. What else? Truthfully, like I don't see the big deal in. Experimenting with drugs, like. But you've experimented with what? Um, I've gone, I've uh, dove into meth. I've um, done many prescription pills. Um, that's actually the first thing I experimented with. I've done acid, all while with my very close friends. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as you got some friends around. <laughs> Bottom line, uh, he tested negative for everything uh, illicit except for marijuana. But I'd like to add to the conversation Dr. Frank Lawless. Dr. Frank Lawless uh, is the chairman of the Dr. Phil Show Advisory Board. Uh, he's the co-founder of the Lawless uh, PV PMP Center uh, in Dallas. Dr. Lawless has also written the book, Not My Child. Dr. Lawless... Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Ian says he's experimented with a lot of drugs, which can have an impact on his brain, of course. But uh, he says he's a regular user of marijuana now, which is legal in his state. Well, first of all, um, Ian is at a very critical, vulnerable time in his life where his brain is going through a pruning, which makes him very vulnerable to any kind of uh, judge any kind of issue that has to do with judgment now put on top of that the this uh, Marijuana the THC is kind of sticky and it creates a stickiness between your neurons and so what happens is that uh, it, it limits your uh, judgment plus other kinds of uh, cognitive abilities so that your thinking becomes circular and is motivation 
one of the things that's affected? Absolutely. You get a lower motivation and you get also uh, increased depression and uh, some level of paranoia. Can you see major shifts in personality? Well, what you often see is this uh, lack of empathy. What Dr. Lawless is talking about is when the brain is in this pruning phase, particularly for some people, that with marijuana use, not even regular or heavy marijuana use, it can create real neurological disruption. Mm -hmm. And if it continues through the pruning process, where it gets to the static phase, usually at age 25, right. then that damage becomes irreparable, correct? That's correct. Um, and at this point, all we know is that um, Ian, you have started to live your life differently, and I'm not saying that the reasons are one-dimensional, but you've said, my life isn't working. A really good theory is that you're having a bad reaction to the marijuana use at a neurological level in terms of reasoning, in terms of motivation, in terms of emotionality. But it's something that based on research, you have to consider. You two are the doctors, and I will consider it. Do you need Dr. Phil's help? Text PHIL to 88500 and share your story for a chance to appear on the show. Standard message and data rates may apply. Your situation is not because they got a TRO to get you out of the house. You are where you are because of the choices you've made. The point is, this is your life. You're the one who needs to put it the way you want it. And it's not where you want it at this point. So I'm just saying I'm willing to help you if you want some help. I, Dr. Lawless is head of the PNP Center in Dallas, Texas. It is, in my opinion, the top diagnostic and treatment center in, in the country. They evaluate people biochemically, neurologically, psychologically, medically, in every way. I'm happy to fly you there at our expense. Dr. Lawless has agreed to, to work you up, do a complete evaluation neurologically, find out what is going on, and see if, in fact, this is having an effect, and give you a complete plan to see uh, where you are and come up with a plan to get you what you want in your life. They don't go, wait, this is all, you're an adult. This is all between you and them. It's private between you and uh, Dr. Lawless. And I think that's a great place to start. After that, I'm happy to get you a life coach. What, anything, whatever. I'm, help, I'm happy to help you find a job. I'm happy to do whatever is necessary to connect you in, in a way that you can get some traction and start getting some joy in your life. And I, I'm, I'm offering to do that if you want that help. Um, I would appreciate it. Um, I'm a little embarrassed. Um, like I said, I'm not used to like taking handouts and um, truthfully I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for these people in front of me. Um, however, if it, if it means progress, I'll do it. Yeah. I've got two sons and one of them's about your age and I would hope if he was off somewhere and was in a similar situation, I would pray to God above that somebody would step up and help him out if he needed it. Yeah. And and I'm doing with you what I hope somebody would do with him if he was in a similar situation. And like I say, I'm not doing it to you, I'm doing it with you. Yeah. You know, let me be a friend here. Let me help you out, okay? Appreciate sure. it. All right. Next, a young woman with devastating news that she thought could find her out of work and struggling. 
Ready to get real? Go to DrPhil.com for advice on relationships, parenting, finances, and more. Plus, weigh in on your favorite episodes, share your stories, and find support in the Dr. Phil community. When you sign up for the community, you will automatically be subscribed to the Dr. Phil Show newsletter. Log on to DrPhil.com today. Imagine waking up and scratching under your arm, but noticing a little something. You think it's a little nothing, but the doctor says it's a big something, the big C. That's what happened to my next guest, Dana. I was 27 at the time, I was healthy. I didn't understand what having breast cancer meant and, and what that was really going to mean for the, the rest of my life. It was horribly surreal. My family and friends, we were just completely shocked. The good news is that we caught it very early. I attacked my treatment and my cancer like a bull. I decided to do a, a double mastectomy because of the aggressive nature of my cancer. This was the day of surgery. They have done mastectomy. I don't know why I let you guys take any pictures of me. <laughs> as soon as I healed after my surgery, I was immediately into my chemotherapy regime. I knew that I was going to be in and out of the office a lot. I sat down in a room full of coworkers who are all women, and I just had to tell them that, you know, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. My company that I worked for was extremely supportive. They were really there for me throughout the entire treatment and allowed me to leave for my tests and come back or work from home. When I was able to go to work, I was able to forget about my cancer for just a moment and continue on with this life I had before cancer, which was a big deal to me. I've come out the other end and it's made me a better person. I'm sitting here five years out, feeling good. Running a business is crazy to me because I wasn't sure I would get here. Well, Dana is here with us and also joining us is our good friend, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall, Chief Medical Officer of Pfizer. Uh, we just love having you here, so welcome Thank back you, to the show. I love being here. Uh, <clears throat> so, Dana, I'm glad you're here. One of the things you had to go through, and having worked with the oncology population a lot in my career when uh, I was in practice, you, people say they often deal with awkwardness about it because people don't know, do they bring it up? Do they not bring it up? What do they say? It, it was, people felt awkward around you, right? Yeah, I don't know if people know what to say. I've heard many things of, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, honey, you're just so young. And even weirder things of, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, my aunt or whoever had breast cancer and she didn't make it. And to hear something like that from, you know, a, a friend or a stranger is, is really difficult when you've just been diagnosed. Yeah, and people don't know. People don't. I mean, what do you say when you receive news like this, um, especially in a workplace, for example, where it's not close friends and family? Um, it's so awkward. And everyone wants to be helpful. We were talking earlier. And so many people have challenges with this that um, there's information out there that's available, like on cancerandcareers.org. Uh, there are great tips on how you figure out. How do you figure out saying something that is um, authentic, heartfelt, helpful, and not hurtful? So what to say and maybe mostly what not to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a recent survey on just that. Um, it was commissioned by Pfizer and an organization that I just mentioned, uh, Cancer and Careers. And um, in that survey, 77% of working women that were surveyed with breast cancer said that they found work to really help support their recovery. And as it turns out, that view is often held as well by healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. Now, you had a great experience with your employer, um, supportive, engaging, kind of worked with you on that. There was another survey that was done recently and the news wasn't quite so good. And this was in women with metastatic breast cancer. And in that survey, 50% of women left their jobs after their cancer diagnosis. Half of those were involuntary. And 20% more felt that they had experienced some job-related discrimination. And balancing treatment with your job is also important, right? You've, you've, you've got to find some way to do one 
and and get it to jive with the other and it's not always easy right well and i'm really glad that you put it that way because it's not one or the other i mean what you want to do is to figure out how you can do both how you can have uh, the best support for your health and how you can thrive in the workplace and there are lots of things that you can do um, to do that first of all a really good conversation with your doctor or healthcare provider to find out what does my diagnosis and treatment mean to my work and what might my work mean to my diagnosis and my treatment with that information in hand you want to do some more investigation you want to find out what kinds of resources and programs might be available with your employer with the government with other work communities that you belong to or are part of how those things then fit together is important because you want to plan that you can implement with your employer, with your health care team, uh, with your family, friends, and the rest of your support network. Um, and then be able to move that forward again to thrive in the workplace, but to also have the best outcome. Anyone with questions or wanting more information or links to resources can go to GetHealthyStayHealthy.com. Yeah. And when you go to GetHealthyStayHealthy.com, and you click on this discussing cancer with your doctor and and working out a plan you've got to be active in managing your disease right you just don't become passive you you, you stay active with it yeah you have to i mean you know i lived day to day by a calendar for that entire year yeah. of my life well uh doctor you're, you're right it's all about planning and this is so important we are going to continue this conversation tonight uh, starting at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time on Twitter. So follow me at Dr. Phil, and you can search hashtag cancer and careers to join us. And right up until that time, be on GetHealthyStayHealthy.com. You can look at the points that are there. It'll kind of tell you what we're going to be talking about over on that conversation. So I want to thank all of my guests today, especially our longtime good friend, Dr. Frida Lewis-Hall. Dana, we thank you for being here, and congratulations on five years clean and clear. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much.